Day six. I've been inside the tank for hours or days, maybe weeks, immersed in my own thoughts and floating through time and space at the mercy of transistors, high speed wiring and the tubes that feed me and take my waste away. The universe is open and I am one with the life stream of the cosmos. I can think and see clearly for the first time, though my eyes see nothing but darkness. The filtered void of the cosmos when time ends and the last star has been switched off forever. I'm Christopher Columbus discovering America. I'm Albert Einstein pondering the imponderables of general relativity, like George Malloroy climbing Everest. I'm climbing this mountain because it's there. The future is obscured. The outcomes of this experiment unknown. This could be the greatest medical breakthrough since the discovery of penicillin. It could also be the greatest weapon since the atom bomb, a torture device for a digital age. I need more time, but time is frozen in suspended hibernation. I'm all mind and no matter a purpose-built machine to unravel the mysteries that have plagued my people since knowledge first began. My findings thus far are inconclusive. Day 87. Damn it all to hell! I, I despair of myself. Time? What of it? These stupid words mean nothing. My breath steams off me as nanobots destroy and rebuild whole worlds in the blinks of blind eyes. As long as there's life inside my chest, electrical pulses pumping blood to these senseless organs, I will pursue the truth. I know, I know I'm close. The stars, the space, the seas, the sunlight are all intertwined and all will collapse together. Oh, it's, it's enough to kill a man. <sighs> I still hear music and the passing thoughts that flow through my mind are manifest and as real as you are. Will I ever walk in the land of the living again? And when I make my ultimate discovery, who will I share it with? These questions, they gnaw upon my conscience and bury me with the unknown. Every question, every thought and every obsession pass through my hive mind. I'm only human. I remember nothing but the tank. And that's all right. I've come to terms with that. And so I'll sleep. There's nothing left for me in my waking state. When I dream, I'm enlightened. And when I'm awake, I process the mysteries that I dream about. There's so, so much for me to dream about. Day 32. This is torture. My eyes are blinded and all memory erased beyond hope of recollection. I'm a hollow shell awaiting the reaver who will take me and end this infernal misery. We'll take over this world together. United, we'll discover the meaning which flickers between synapses and sparks this life. There's no fear, no claustrophobia. Just the knowledge that this history of our time is open and that there's a war we have not won. This war against time and space and the eight dimensions which hold my body in constant flux from one excruciating second to the next. Oh, this is real science. The kind of science that tests on animals and pushes until no boundaries are left. Just to see the world burn. I've got good news for you, pal. The world won't burn while there's still some single-celled organism still breathing life in the cosmos we see before us when we close our eyes in the middle of the night. I'm at the center. I'm the nervous system for this whole damn operation. I'm the fool who dared to go first, taking one giant leap for mankind. 
And it's dark in here. So dark that light is just a memory. All that was learned is forgotten and all that was borrowed returned. I am my own politician. <laughs> I aim to reform Gaia in a bold new world order. The sound of my heartbeat is deafening and non-existent. I'm complete isolation, drifting lost inside the tank. This is my home now. I've grown tired of this entrenchment. I must leave to drift among the stars in real solitude, to grasp the scepter of power as time flashes by in a rush of grey, counting down the hours, the minutes, the seconds, until I'm released to feel the sunlight. Day 129. And the sky burns incandescent, the arc breaking the sky. The riders pirouette lazily as flame-tipped lances pierce the clouds. And I, I ride gloriously at their head, leading the assault on the Commonwealth. But at least I feel the soil beneath my feet, the burn of the toxic wind as it whips and bites around me. I am the noise, the war between matter and antimatter, the blood mixing together in the ground to be trodden on by future generations. And then we fall back to the ground. We roll through the dirt for the joy of sensation, for the need to feel ourselves. I become aware that I'm dreaming. And my mind and my body have undergone a separation. The last of the warm air shreds the skin from my forehead and reminds me that a return to isolation is imminent. With eyes glazed with honey-dewed ecstasy, I must be getting on to the newest of the age-old aphorisms, which taught me how all is one and one is all. Day 170. The reflection skills arousal depth thinking inconsolable hypergalactic unleavened anaphylactic tree stumps hamper down the help me counselling falling underneath spelling coliseum's bedding quality between the magnificent sex which please God save tiny gummies dispensing lies upon lies upon lies sinking creep hanging sleep watching the everlasting must hold light spreading over lititing children blue star liberty forgiveness not underneath the skid stop it together not disappear firewall inconsolable tipping in time, acceptance, dining, death charts, long to go, collapsing death stars together, action pump, ceiling, orgasms, penting, dissolution, stalomas, down, launching, stratocolumus, not much, united answer for feeling, hunter, fantasized, institutional, pornographic, and drudges left of me, crying wallpaper laxatives. Day 229. I was gone for a while, but I've returned to the light. I am no longer a human. I am just an entity, sharing this tiny cranium with a million others, displaced from the heavenly homes we once hoped to discover through science, as if science is the answer to the mysteries of our magnified civilization. It's time to get rarefied, all right? This discovery will change everything forever. The world, as I left it, is unprepared for this. Will anyone believe it? I don't, and I've seen it. I've seen the light at last. I'm near omniscient. I know everything, except the time and my release date. I'm stuck here, in this prison, with nothing left to discover. The secret came to me in a sudden bang of inspiration. I knew then that every torturous second of my self-imposed exile in the tank had been magnificent. My mind is a finely honed supercomputer, a machine that could never be recreated. I exist, have existed, and will exist for this one reason only. All of the pain has been worth it. All of the endless empty hours finally justified by the revolutionary nature of my mission. 
my journey has been successful. Get ready, world, to be torn apart by the incredible, unforgettable truth. In a darkened, temperature-controlled room deep beneath the surface of the Earth, two scientists surveyed the scene from behind the visors of their hazmat suits. It's a highly sensitive experiment, they'd been warned. Any discrepancy in visibility, sound, temperature, or even oxygen level could kill the professor on her return. But they weren't prepared for this. The laboratory was so dark that they had to find the sensory deprivation tank based almost entirely on their memory of the floor plan. The two men communicated in silence, transmitting messages from visor to visor. Hurry up, Dave. I'm right beside the pod. Engage the mechanism. Roger that. The young scientist held his hand out serenely in the dark, breaking the invisible beam that triggered the release switch. Twenty feet away, the tank opened silently and slowly. It took several minutes until the two halves were fully separated. Then the machinery began to wind down. First the breathing, feeding and excrement tubes slowly disengaged from the rest of the mechanism. Then the artificial lungs slowly disconnected themselves, encouraging their patient to breathe the air of the outside world for the first time in nine months. Slowly but surely, minute after painstaking minute, the machinery untangled itself and returned the pod's occupant to reality. The two scientists stood back and watched as best as they could in the total darkness. Their true eyes saw nothing. They were forced to trust the artificial eyes that the company had installed in their suits six years earlier when the experiment was first conceived. All right, I'm going in, Dave. Yes, sir, I'm right behind you. Let's get it over with and get back to the surface as quickly as we can. This place gives me the creeps. Well, you know what they say. If it doesn't scare the hell out of you, it's not real science. Let's do this. The two scientists edged slowly closer to the pod. In the silence, even the buzzing in their heads sounded like an avalanche. Niels, the senior scientist, was the first to peer into the pod. Dave followed suit shortly afterwards. We're picking up nothing from your visor cams. Don't forget us. We're back here in reality, gentlemen. We need an update. We won't be hearing from her again, buddy. She's dead. It's true. She must have been dead for months. There's nothing left of her but skin and bones. Don't be ridiculous. We were picking up life signs less than an hour ago. Well, there's nothing down here now, sir. The experiment was a failure. Send in the cleaning crew. Roger that. Return to base immediately. Before they left, Niels braved one last look into the pod. Its single occupant was barely human, just a shroud of skin and bone in the dark, more like a plaster mold of a skeleton than the living, breathing scientist who'd climbed into the pod at the start of the year. All that remained were the eyes, milky and covered in a phosphorescent dew, but still intact. Those eyes would haunt the two men forever. Even through the haze of their computerized display, they could read them. It was like looking at the scans of a fetus, only infinitely more terrible. Those eyes, that marveled, eternal serenity, as though they held the wisdom of the ages. And as they backtracked towards the high-powered escalator to return to the surface, they saw them everywhere in the dark. With a sharp burst of static, another message appeared on their visors, a message sent by neither the scientists in the field nor their superiors a kilometre above them, a message sent by no scientist on the face of the earth. The fear, the legion, the horror, the cosmos. Cosmos, written and narrated by Dane Cobain, pod occupant played by Susie DeMarco, Kaufman, played by Paul Cooper, Dave, played by Willis Forge, and Niels, played by Ali Lightfoot.